Movie footage used in the kill count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching The Purge in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're starting a new franchise with The Purge, a dystopian film released in 2013. The Purge currently consists of three movies, all written and directed by James DeMonico, with a fourth film, the prequel The First Purge, set to come out this year on the 4th of July. The premise of The Purge series is well known by now. Once a year in the United States, for 12 hours, all crime becomes legal in order to let human beings release the beast and get all their frustrations out. Although The Purge results in record low crime rates for the rest of the year and a booming economy for the country in general, the films tend to criticize the experiment as being cold, heartless, and way more brutal for poor folk, as opposed to the better off who celebrate the holiday behind high-tech security systems. The Purge is one of those rare movie series where the first film is generally regarded as the worst, maybe because the sequels do a better job looking at the societal impact of Purge Night and feature more interesting characters than the Sandin family of the inaugural film. But all of these films share at least one thing in common, a high body count. How many kills does the original Purge have? Let's find out out and get to them. The movie begins with a card of text setting up the situation in America, 2022. Sounds like a pretty sweet place, with crime barely existing. With, of course, the one exception of title card! I mean the purge. The one exception of the purge. Then, while Claire de Lune plays quietly over the opening credits, we see a montage of purge kills throughout the years, from the first purge in 2017 to the latest purge of 2021. During this sequence, I count 26 kills. These montage kills are based on people who we see get shot, or bodies that we see lying completely still. I don't include people who we see getting beat up. Up. I went frame by frame to get this number, and boy was it annoying to do so. I also consulted other kill counts and body counts on the internet, and to be honest, they had all sorts of different numbers between them. So the important thing here is that it doesn't really matter. I don't care if your count is different, it's fine. Driving home to his gated community is James Sandin, played by Ethan Hawke, who just got word that he was the top seller of security systems at his company, probably from selling them all to his bougie neighbors like Mr. Kelly here, just one of many rich people looking for safety on purge night. In fact, it seems like all the neighbors are real friendly to James and his lovely wife Mary, played by Lena Headey, who is one of the world's best people and I love her so much. But neighbor Grace does let slip that a few people may be resentful of the Sandin family's success. You know your husband sold a new security system to almost every home in this community. You know, some people are actually saying this neighborhood paid for that new addition on your home. But listen, Grace, regardless of price, you're gonna want some high-end security for your home. Because as we hear from the radio as James drives home, murdering people during the purge is treated as just a fact of life in this world. Beat from Northern Virginia, what's your purge plan? I'm gonna hunt down my boss. That son of a bitch has it coming. That kind of normalization continues after James gets home, an hour before purge time, as Mary watches a TV doctor justify the practice. The purge not only contains societal violence to a single evening, but the countrywide catharsis creates psychological stability by letting us release the aggression we all have inside of us. James and Mary have two children they'll be looking out for on this holiest of holidays. First is teenage daughter Zoe, who likes to make out with her 18-year-old boyfriend Henry and do weird growling stuff with him. <laughs> cool. But when she hears her dad get home, she sends Henry on his way, because Papa James ain't a fan of how much older Henry is than her. Their other kid is son Charlie, who likes to operate this weird voyeuristic camera attached to Sid's baby doll from Toy Story. He controls it from a little secret cubby hole that's back behind his clothes in the closet. He's real proud of his barbecued baby mobile and his night vision camera that he tells his mom all about while she drinks wine like a mad queen. At dinner, she keeps drinking like she's bunkered down during the Battle of Blackwater, but maybe that's just to deal with her daughter making penis jokes. Eating dinner? No yeah. Come on. As Purge O'Clock draws near, James does a final check on his neighborhood cameras and gets a gun out of his safe as an extra precaution. The family huddles together as James arms the home security system, which seals their huge house shut like a submarine going on a dive. With that, it's Purge time. Most weapons are now legal, some government officials are exempt from the rules, because of course, and for the next 12 hours, all crimes, including murder, are A-OK. -okay. Blessed be our new founding fathers in America, a nation reborn. With a few loud sirens, Purge 2022 begins. The kids are in a sour mood and Charlie especially seems to have an issue with the entire ethos behind the purge. But James is a real purge cheerleader and says it's necessary to make the country a better place. Although, judging by her concerned looks, Mary's not quite as much a purge devotee as her husband. Zoe leaves her family to be alone and gets a surprise hand over the mouth from Henry, who is stowed away in her bedroom to spend the evening's purge with her. After a spot of dry humping, Henry pulls himself away and admits that he's actually there so he can talk to Zoe's dad about their relationship, choosing tonight to do so since James won't be able to just toss him out of the house. Uncle 
Uncle Phil style. Meanwhile, Charlie's driving his creepy baby Terminator around and sees his dad working in his office as a purge feed plays in the background. The feed gives us five more kills for the list. One person gets shot to death in Phoenix, while the Staten Island feed shows three bodies on the ground, and a Florida feed shows another. By the way, this kind of kill counting is my least favorite thing to do. These are just nameless bodies. This isn't fun. When Charlie drives his Bernie baby into the safe room full of monitors, he sees something much more interesting than a bunch of nameless dead bodies. An alive body running down the street and calling out for help. Why won't anybody help me? Charlie sees that ain't no one in this neighborhood about to help that poor dude out, and after hearing some distant gunfire, he decides to disarm his house to help out the unknown man. The armored plates lift up as Charlie calls for the stranger to come inside, and even though James rearms the security system, the stranger manages to slide into home base just in the nick of time. Safe! James and Mary run in to find their son with the stranger, so James begins to pull out his gun! That's when Henry comes down the stairs and calls out James's name before whipping out his own gun and starting a shootout between the two armed men. James lands a hit and knocks Henry down before Zoe rushes out to save the dude who just pulled a gun on her dad? During the chaos, the stranger manages to disappear, and James is straight pissed at Charlie for letting the dude inside their house. James puts his wife and son in the safe room, then heads out to find Zoe so the family can all be together. Instead, he only finds Henry's body dead on the floor and confirms the death by checking his pulse. Unless, you know, Henry's squeezing a ball under his armpit or whatever bullshit y'all said was possible after that Scream 3 fuckery. But the Stansons have a much bigger problem on their hands than a dead Romeo. There's a big old group of well-dressed people in masks approaching their house and staring up into their security cameras. Not the primetime programming you want to see on Purge Night. The leader takes off his mask and introduces his gang as a bunch of good and proper purgers who are ready to cleanse their souls through murder. He's mad that their target, the stranger, got away from them, and that the Sandins have apparently given him refuge inside their home. Mr. and Mrs. The man you're sheltering is nothing but a dirty homeless pig. A grotesque menace to our just society who had the audacity to fight back. The pig doesn't know his place and now he needs to be taught a lesson. Man, the purge is a goddamn Ayn Rand wet dream world. He says that if the Sandins don't give up the stranger before their backup of weapons arrive, they'll break through the Sandins' security system and murder the entire family alongside the stranger. And, uh, that's about it. To the loose ended. The power is cut, putting the house on a backup generator, and James admits that their security system is mostly an aesthetic one. It's not built for worst case scenarios. Because of this vulnerability, James plans to just give the purgers what they want, even though Charlie's not a fan of that plan. Sorry, Charlie. As his parents hunt through their dark home to find the stranger, Charlie watches on the monitors as the purgers dance around like they're in the opening credits of a sitcom. No, seriously, watch this. <laughs> Charlie uses his robot baby to find the stranger before his parents do, and, with some light flashes, gets the guy to follow the toy to safety inside his secret closet cubbyhole. Respect, little man. The lead purger calls James over to the front door for a smarmy little chat. James assures him that this is just a misunderstanding, and that he's a huge fan of the purge and doesn't want to deny anyone that right. But that doesn't stop another purger from yelling at him to hand over the stranger now! That bit of insolence gets him a bullet to the brain from the lead purger, which is why I'm not calling him his credited character name of Plight Leader. Shooting your minions is never play, even if they are being rude. In any case, seeing this psychopathic yuppie in action spurs James to redouble his efforts to find the stranger. Charlie continues his VR expedition, and there's a real cheap jump scare when sister Zoe appears in front of the camera to tell him that she's gonna go hide in Charlie's secret cubbyhole. That's bound to get awkward, and it does in no time, cause James walks in on the stranger pressing Henry's gun to Zoe's head, and asking for James to just leave him alone until the night is over. James argues back that if he doesn't give the stranger to the purgers, they'll kill his whole family. Girl, we don't deserve this. I don't deserve this either. Eventually, Mary shows up with her own gun, and the stranger tries to make a run for it, but James gets him down and incapacitates him with a gunshot to the stomach. Together, the parents duct tape the stranger and try to tie him to a chair, but the stranger fights back, so James directs Mary to take a letter opener and stab him in his stomach wound? Charlie pleads for his mom not to do it, but she follows orders, and the excruciating pain takes the fight out of the stranger enough for them to tie him to the chair. Still, between her son's disappointment and the stranger's very human eyes casting judgment, Mary begins to have second thoughts about this sacrificial plan. Plan. This is so wrong. This is so wrong. <laughs> Charlie runs off, then Mary runs off to follow him, because this movie constantly has these family members needlessly splitting up to inflate the tension and drama. Take for another example, how after a short convo with her father, Zoe leaves to go off on her own as well. Great! The stranger sees this family drama play out and tells James to just go ahead and save his children. Take me outside. 
That act of kindness changes James's mind about the plan, and he tells Mary he was wrong. Charlie shows up again, because the blocking in this movie is completely random and pointless, and James gives him a gun and tells him to hide. Hide from what? Those new weapons that have finally shown up for the purgers, including a bunch of chains that they're now attaching to the doors and windows of the Sandin home. James's new plan is to defend their house, meaning the final half hour of this movie is going to be a home invasion flick. This final act kicks off with the lead purger reprimanding the Sandins for failing to give them their purge prey. That piece of filth that you are protecting exists only to serve our need to purge! So I bid thee farewell, sweet Sandy. Release the beast, boys! Let the killing commence! A truck revs up and rips away the armored walls of their security system, so with one final loving look, the Sandin split up to kill some home invaders. The purgers begin to infiltrate the house, firing off their guns and skipping down the hallway with machetes. Anything to put those creepy masks to good use. One of them does a big old jump scare on Charlie in the laundry room, but before he can kill the kid, he gets shot five times from behind by James with his handgun putting down the first purger of the film, but definitely not the last. James puts Charlie back in the safe room, then heads out with this crazy-looking shotgun that he uses to shoot another purger to death with in short order. Two down, plenty to go, Jimmy, my boy. He tries to shoot a couple more in his rec room, but they manage to dodge his blasts and nearly take his head off with an axe. As he's being choked with his own gun against the pool table, James manages to grab a billiard ball and smash the male purger in the head with it. Then he shoots the axe-swinging purger lady straight off the pool table with a shotgun, killing her. When the male purger attacks James with a pool cue, Papa Sandin fights him off and kills him by smashing his head against a pinball machine a few times. That's gotta be worth an extra ball at least. A new purger flies through the window and tackles James, but after he misses him a whole bunch of times with his handgun, James is able to fight him off and use the lady purger's axe to hack him in the back, which I would count as a kill regardless, but just in case you're not convinced these two male purgers are dead, James double taps both of them with his shotgun, ensuring their rifle places on the kill count. Right about now, you're probably rooting for James, so it's a shame that he rounds a corner straight into the lead purger and a knife in the belly. The obnoxious prick of a lead purger whispers douchey words into James's ear as he lays him on the ground, probably reciting some passages from Atlas Shrugged, before he exits the room and leaves James bleeding on the floor by himself. From his safe spot in the room with all the monitors, Charlie watches as the purgers hanging out around their house get shot to death by the Sandin family's neighbors, who seem to be walking with quite a purpose towards the house. Good thing they're there, because Mary gets jumped by a couple of masked purgers who tickle torture her and get ready to kill her with a machete before the neighbors open fire on this pair as well, killing them with a bunch of shots from their handguns. The neighbors are catching up to James's KD pretty quickly. They get even more kills after walking away from Mary, since we hear them fire their guns into a couple of squishy targets off screen, along with some bodies falling. Mary recovers and finds her husband bleeding on the floor, and after crying out for her children, is joined by Charlie. That's when lead purger shows up to finish the job off and murder the whole lot of them. But as you probably guessed, he gets shot to death before he's able to do so. This time the shooter isn't a neighbor showing up out of nowhere, it's Zoe showing up out of nowhere. I'm glad the lead purger is dead and all, but the movement of these characters drives me insane. Oh well, at least the family is reunited just in time for James to die from that little prick's big prick with a knife. Yep, top build Ethan Hawke just bit the big one and joined the kill count. What's even left to happen here? How about some payoff for that line from Grace earlier about the neighborhood being jealous of the Sandins? Because these neighbors aren't on a rescue mission. Truth is, you're ours, not theirs. Grace directs the rest of the neighbors to tie up Mary and the children so they can all get murdered right back. Mary fights with a fervor for her children, since some would say her love for them is her only redeeming quality. Well, that and her cheekbones. But it's no use. They all get tied up anyway, as Grace explains why they need to vent their hatred on this purgy night. You made so much money off of us, and then you just stuck it in our faces. Lena Headey puts in an amazing performance, as per usual, as she begs for her children's lives. But these neighbors are just as blind to her pitch-perfect passion as the Television Academy, so they recite a prayer to the new founding fathers and prepare to kill the remaining Sandins. That's when the stranger shows up. He knocks one dude out and, after grabbing Grace, shoots Mr. Kelly to death with a handgun. Should have stayed in that secure home you paid for, Mr. Kelly. Apparently, the stranger managed to untie himself from the chair and I guess hide during the big purger battle that took place. Now he directs the neighbors to free the Sandin family before holding the duplicitous friends at gunpoint. He tells Mary that it's her choice whether or not he kills them, but Mary says no. Oh, they were going to kill us. It doesn't matter. We are gonna play the rest of this night out in motherfucking peace. Cut to morning, where it's T-minus two minutes until purge time is over. Must have been a real awkward night sitting around the table, huh? When Mary gets distracted by her dead husband's body, Grace makes a final grab for the gun, but Mary ain't having it and shuts that shit down. Did you hear what I said? No more killing tonight! 
As Grace's nose bleeds like a faucet, a loud siren blares, signaling the end of Purge 2022. Mary evicts the neighbors from her house and thanks the stranger for his help. He leaves with a simple message. Good luck. Yeah, good luck finding another neighborhood to move to with as good a school district, am I right? The movie ends with the Sandins looking out over their bloody front lawn as a news broadcast reports that this has been the most successful Purge yet. Now, obviously, such an insane premise for the film is gonna net us a bunch of kills, but did it break any kill count records? Let's find out and get to the numbers. I counted 47 deaths in The Purge, which would be a new record if not for that bastard Belko. I'm not gonna try to discern the genders of all those security cam deaths, so of the on-screen deaths that I could figure out, there were 11 dudes and 3 ladies for the victims. That comes out to this pie chart, with a majority of the victims unknown. Sorry. With a runtime of 95 minutes, we had a kill on average just about every 2 minutes. Wowee! I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the purger who gets hacked in the back, I guess. Cause it was something different. Dull machete for lamest kill? Take your pick. Let's say, uh, this guy. Sure. Everyone just gets shot in these movies, man. And that's it! The Purge was released in 2013 and quickly became part of the cultural zeitgeist, with references to it everywhere, including an entire episode of Rick and Morty, which no, I'm never gonna kill count, so don't ask. I will kill count the sequel, The Purge Anarchy, next Friday, but until then, I'm James A. Janice, this has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Kenny Seawall and Sam G Films. I gotta ask you all to check out this new project I'm in that just launched. It's called D&D&D &D &D and it's a Dungeons and Dragons podcast. I play a bard in it. Just click up there, up there? Just click up there to take you to a link with more information. There's also info in the description below. Episodes are gonna come out every Monday and Wednesday. All right, be good people.